rock a little bit? One heart? I think that's track number 12. A little louder? Uh-huh, give me some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a new world on the horizon made of light, not of storm. Calling out to all creation, you are not alone. Come on, lions and lambs, saints and sinners, best of friends, enemies, woman and man, losers and winners. They're all in you and me. A little louder. We are one heart. We're looking for answers. We are one soul. Finding our way through the dark. One dream we share together. We are all of us. Of one heart, yes, yes, we are. We, yes, we are. Out in the cold, there are faces hidden by the wind. Take it and bring you home again. We are one heart. We look for answers. We are one soul. Finding the way through the dark. One dream we share together. We are all of us. One heart, one mind. 
and one soul. We are one heart, one mind. Check this out. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine all the people, yeah, sharing all the world. Imagine all the people loving one another. We are one heart, one mind. I want to hear you say, say one heart. Woo! Say one for letting me sing. They wouldn't let me sing in the first service. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Before we get into the talk, I want us as a community to continue to hold in the consciousness of truth the people that have been affected by Charleston. We've all been affected not just the people in Charleston, but this is a divine invitation. This is a divine call for all of us to step into divine right action from that place of divine inspiration. And sometimes there's a red invitation. Sometimes things have to happen that seem really horrible to, to motivate us to do what there is to do. Because as my friend and I were speaking about earlier, we can be so spiritual that we're no earthly good. And it's, impo it's important that from our spiritual experience, from our oneness with the divine, that we are guided to divine right action to dissolve the dis-ease that is going on on this planet. Yes, can I get an amen? And that means more than prayer. That means from prayer, we are guided to divine action or divine right in action. Because Ernest Holmes also says, he that can most perfectly practice in action, to him all things are possible. But that doesn't mean to be just silent. It means in action, in, in the power and presence of God, in the silence, and from the silence we are guided to divine right action. Today my topic is the divine invitation, get dressed for the party. I'd like to reference Matthew 22, 14, where it says, many are called, but few are chosen. How many of you have heard that scripture before? Well, my dad was a Baptist minister. Hey, can I get an amen? And I used to hear that scripture all the time when I was a little girl. And he'd say to me, baby, many are called. Uh-huh. But few are chosen. Are you one of the chosen ones? And I'd look up at my daddy with my little young 15-year-old heart, knowing that I'd just snuck out the window the night before. <laughs> Nothing like a PK's kid. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, daddy, I, 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 think I'm, I think I'm one of the chosen ones. But in my young heart, the way that scripture had been translated for me, I never felt that I could live up to the standards to be one of the chosen ones. I just couldn't be good enough. I just couldn't be perfect enough to be considered one of the chosen ones. But I decided that I was gonna try, I was gonna give it my best shot. I decided I was gonna be perfect. And I could only pull it off in 30 minute intervals. And I'd get all the way to 28 and a half minutes. I wouldn't breathe, I wouldn't move, I wouldn't do anything. And then somebody would have to put on some Motown music. And I'd have to start moving my body the way the Baptists pretend they don't move. Or somebody would say something to make me mad. 
And I'd have to say one of those words the Baptists pretend they never say. <laughs> and because my dad was a pastor of his own church, and we used to have visiting churches come to worship with us all the time, they'd always bring a busload of cute boys. <laughs> and I'd have to invite one of them behind the church to smoke a cigarette. Because many are called. But few are chosen. Can I get an amen? And then when I got pregnant at 16 years old, I just had to just rip up my application to the pearly gates. It was like, I'm never getting in now. Pregnant, 16 years old. Because many are called, but few are chosen. That's what they told me. I love it that Jesus spoke in parables when he likened the kingdom of heaven to when a king sent his servants out to invite special guests to attend the wedding banquet that he was putting on for his son. And the servants, they came upon the first set of guests who looked at the invitation and said, oh, no, that's, that invitation's not for us. That's for the Joneses down the street. Sorry. And so they took the invitation to the Joneses down the street, and the Joneses looked at the invitation and said, oh, Please give the king our regrets. We're so busy on that day. We're not going to be able to make it. And so the servants reported this back to the king. And the king being the king, he's like, what's up with that? I'm the king. He says, well, I want you to go, and I want you to go invite them again. This time tell them that I have prepared oxen and fat and cattle and all of the meats and wines and delectables that they could want. But this time I want you to also invite the recovering alcoholics and the vegetarians. Because there's something in the kingdom of heaven for everybody. Tofu and celery juice and all that stuff. Yes? Can I get an amen? And the invitation was still declined. And so this time, the king said to the servants, go and extend the invitation to everyone. Not just the special, the so-called special guest. Because everyone is special. I want you to invite the good, the bad, the rich, the poor, the believers, the non-believers. Everyone is invited to partake of the feast that's being held in honor of my son. And on the day of the feast, he looked around the banquet hall, and it was filled with guests, and he was pleased. But he noticed one guest in particular who was not properly dressed for this most prestigious event. And the king is like, what's up with that? So he approached the guest, and he says, why aren't you dressed? And the guest had no answer. He was speechless. And so the king ordered his servants, bind him hand and foot, and kick him out into a sea of darkness where there will be much weeping and gnashing of the teeth. And when I heard that part of it when I was a little girl, I was like, oh my God, I'm so going to hell. And they're going to bind me hand and feet, by, by my feet, and kick me out to a sea of darkness. So how blessed I was when the day came. As much as I love my daddy and respect my daddy, who's no longer with us on this side of the veil, there came a day when I had to leave behind my daddy's church. And I had to leave behind his belief system. And I had to leave behind his God. And I had to go within and I had to search and find a God of my own understanding. Can I get an amen? amen? And as I began to go within and I began to inquire about the nature of this God, that it had to be more than, 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 than what I was raised to believe, that it had to be something that I didn't have to be afraid of, that it had to be something that didn't withhold itself from me, that, that, that it just had to be more than that. And as, as I sincerely went within with a humble and open heart, asking what is the nature of this power and presence that we call God, the first thing that was revealed to me is that little word God, G-O-D, is too small to describe the indescribable. It is too small to describe that which is infinite. And that the nature of this thing that we call God, life, universal presence or whatever higher power or whatever it is that you choose to call it its nature is omnipotent meaning all only not some 
Not a little bit. Not more than. Only. All. All power. Let me hear you say all power. All power. There is nothing else. And its nature is omnipotent and omnipresent, meaning that it is everywhere present in its totality at every point in the universe. And if that's true, then it is impossible for this group over here to be included into the kingdom of heaven, which is not a place or a destination, but is a state of consciousness. Amen? Amen. And exclude this group of people, this group, because of your beliefs or because of your race or because of whatever or you know everyone is included everyone is wanted everyone is an expression of this infinite omnipotent omnipresence even the 16 year old pregnant girls we are all wanted we are all needed this invisible something allness needs us to express itself no matter where you are, who you are, or where you've been. And when that was revealed to me, coming out of being the way I was raised, I'm like, I'm one with God, no stuff? Like, like for real? It's like, oh my God, that is so cool. That's so cool, isn't that cool? I was like jazz. I was like, you mean it's not like Santa Claus up in the sky? It's like, like it's, it's, it's within me. That is so awesome. But then I started thinking. <laughs> you know how you have a revelation and then you think yourself right out of it? Well, that's what I did. I started thinking. And I thought, wait a minute. If God is infinite love and inexhaustible good and harmony and peace and 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 prosperity and all that there is and it's individualized as me that's what you told me is not what you told me then where's my stuff <laughs> how many of you ever asked that question before don't lie <laughs> if god is all that where's my stuff and the answer that was revealed through me was about y'all, so I'm going to have to talk about you. Is that the moment you have a preference, the moment you have a wish, the moment you see something that you like, Scripture says, before you call, I will answer. And while you are speaking, I will hear. That the moment that you have a preference, the moment you say an affirmation, the moment that you say a prayer or a wish, bam, uh, it is done in the mind of God, in the quantum field of infinite possibility. Is that right? But here's the thing. If you are not lined up vibrationally in your consciousness, if you are not dressed, in the proper attire in your consciousness of worthiness and deservingness and oneness with the divine, then you're not a match for, the, for your own prayer. And so you show up at the party, you show up and the guards meet you at the gate and they say to you, your good is waiting for you. It's here, it's yours, it's your divine inheritance, it's your divine entitlement. We know that, but you've got to know it. Go away and go grow. Go get clear about who you are. Clean up the static so that you can remember who you are as an expression of the divine. And most of us don't hear that when our stuff doesn't come through, when we're not manifesting fast enough. What most of us are hearing is, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, somebody else has my good. Is that right? And then we are kicked out in our own consciousness into a sea of darkness where there is much weeping and gnashing of the teeth. That's what that part of the scripture means. That we are bound hand and foot by our own consciousness. Ernest Holmes says the same thoughts that, can, that, can, that bind you are the same thoughts that can free you. So we are bound hand and foot by our own limited, fearful, thinking not on purpose 
but because we've been conditioned to think we are less than God. I remember many, many years ago when I was extended one of the most significant invitations of my life. And it showed up in this beautiful ivory-colored envelope, and it said, Esther, you are cordially invited to attend a life free from drug addiction and alcoholism. And that invitation showed up in my consciousness. It, it, it felt like a curtain had opened just for a moment, like the cloud had lifted just for a moment. And I saw myself the way God saw me. How many of you have had a glimpse of that, of seeing yourself the way God sees you? I saw myself as confident and whole and walking in my own brand of dignity and not afraid, not afraid. But I caught a glimpse of that, and it, it was so bright, it was so beautiful that it scared me. You know why it scared me? Because I knew that I, could, I didn't have the power to maintain and sustain that. But what I didn't know is that I didn't need to know the how. All I needed to do was say yes. But because I didn't know how to maintain and sustain that, I took that invitation and I threw it up on the desk with all of the other invitations where I had RSVP'd, no, not now, I can't. How many of you have a desk, a closet, a drawer full of declined invitations, no, not now, I can't? And if it's not hanging out in your house in a physical place, where is it hanging out in your consciousness? No, not now, I can't do it. One of you, thank you. <laughs> so shortly thereafter, the pink invitation came. And I said, Esther, it is highly suggested that you attend a life free from drug addiction and alcoholism, that you attend a life of stepping into your own brand of dignity, who you were created to be in the first place. And this invitation showed up as my losing yet another job and my utilities being disconnected once again. I looked at that invitation and I said, wait a minute, everybody's making way too big a deal out of this I'm a drug addict thing. I'm not a drug addict. If only all the employers who fired me would have gotten the memo <laughs> that every Monday's a holiday. <laughs> and all the utility companies would just give me a break. And I threw that invitation up on the desk. But then came the red invitation. And it said, Esther, it's time. I will not take no for an answer. Your good is chasing you down. You will remember who you are. You will remember that you are an expression of the divine and that you are worthy and that you are deserving. Now we can do this the easy way. <laughs> or we can do this your way. And that invitation showed up with my family knocking on my door to remove my daughter from an unfit environment. And my daughter holding onto my leg, begging me to not let them take her. And me wanting with all my soul and all of my heart to make that promise to that little girl. I won't let them take you, sweetheart. And, I'll, and I'll, I promise to be a good mother. I promised to get better, sweetheart. But I knew in my soul that I couldn't make that promise. I knew that 15 minutes after I made that promise that I would break it. I knew that I was powerless and my life had become unmanageable. And that I couldn't think my way into wholeness. I couldn't figure my way into wholeness. How many of you know that you can't figure your way into wholeness? that you can't think your way into wholeness. And so I watched as my family walked out the door with my heart. But that got my attention. I looked at that red invitation and I said, I don't know how you're gonna pull this off, God, but okay. Do with me whatever you wanna do. I know I can't do it my way anymore. Say, I don't know how you're going to pull this off, God. Let me hear you say it. I don't know how you're going to pull this off, God. <laughs> Whatever it is that you're looking at that seems bigger than you, I want you to say, I don't know how you're going to pull this off, God. 
and hear the universe say within you, good, <laughs> sit down, let me do my job. And I said to the universe, I'm ready to come to my party, but I don't have anything to wear. I don't have anything proper to wear to the feast that, be, that is being held in my honor. And I felt the universe say, oh, baby, but you have something to wear. Scripture says, come as you are. He said, go look in your closet. And in the closet was hanging this red, raggedy dress, dingy, full of holes. But it was a, it was a designer dress made by this famous designer called Willingness. And these raggedy turned over shoes made by this famous designer called Surrender. And I slipped on my shoes of Surrender and I put on my red raggedy dress of willingness. And there were days when I crawled to my party feeling like I had nothing left, feeling like I just wanted to give up, feeling like it was just too hard. I was just too scared. It was just too hard. How many of you have had that experience where you just, it was just you just didn't know how you were going to make it. But there was something within you, that inner power within you, and all of the angels around you, within you, saying, one more step, beloved. I know you can make it. I know who you are, baby. One more step. And I crawled up the steps to where my party was being held. And the guards met me at the gate, and they said, welcome home, beloved. We've been waiting for you a long time. Your worthiness has been waiting for you a long time. Your self-love has been waiting for you a long time. Your empowerment, your confidence has been waiting for you a long time. Welcome home. And I went in to the party, and I got to stay. And that is why I can stand before you today with 29 years of recovery. Okay. You're saying, great, that's a great story, but what does that have to do with me? I'm not addicted to drugs and alcohol. I'm not addicted to anything. How many of you are saying that out there? How many of you are saying I'm not addicted to anything? <laughs> Let's talk about what addiction is. Addiction is when you have become enslaved, in bondage, abnormally attached to a belief system a thought pattern and behavior pattern that is out of alignment with your soul's highest vision. Can I get an amen? amen? An addiction is an effect. That's all it is. It's an effect. And it doesn't matter what effect it takes. Sometimes it might take being addicted to drugs and alcohol, but most of the time it takes on the effect of just being addicted to the mental chatter that's running in your mind 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Amen? How many of you have mental chatter running in your mind? And if you're microscopically honest about that mental chatter that you can't shut off, no matter how much you try to shut it down, if you're microscopically honest with yourself, ask yourself, is this mental chatter in alignment with my vision? Or is it in opposition to my vision? And then we wonder why. There's the gnashing of the teeth. We have a vision, but our thoughts, that are, that our dominant thinking, is an exact, exact opposition to that which we want. Why? Because we're addicted to that mental chatter. And the cause of all addiction is based in, as Bill Wilson, founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, would say, a spiritual malady, a mental obsession, and a physical allergy. And a spiritual malady based on metaphysics is simply the addiction to thinking you are separate and apart from God. That is the very cause of any issue that's going on in your life, is the addicted thought, the habitual thought, that you're separate and apart from your very soul. So I know if you can't relate to being addicted to drugs and alcohol, food, sex, porn, or whatever those obvious addictions are, that you can relate to being addicted to fear. Amen? Amen. To suffering. Amen? Amen. Resentment. Amen? Amen? Jealousy. Amen? Amen? Thinking that something external to you is your source. Amen? Amen? 
So perhaps you can relate to this story when I was with Rod Stewart many years ago and I felt the ivory invitation after I had been with him for five years. And the ivory in invitation starts off as inspiration. It starts off as a divine idea. Oh, I could, I could sing lead vocals too, Rod Stewart. I could be an author. I could be a teacher. But again, that light was so bright and it scared me. And I immediately shut it down saying, oh, no, 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 never mind. I, uh, never mind. I, I can hang with Rod Stewart for a couple more years. I'm, I'm just bored. I'm just bored with Rod Stewart. And if you had to listen to him sing Maggie Mae every night for, for five years, you'd want to stick a fork in your eye, too. <laughs> so I blamed my turning down the divine invitation on something external to me. How many of you have turned down your invitation and blamed it on someone else? Because it's easier to do that way, isn't it? Shortly thereafter, the pink invitation came, and it said, Esther, you are a licensed spiritual practitioner. You have released your first inspirational CD. I have given you this opportunity to sing with Rod Stewart and Beth Midler and in front of tens of thousands of people so that you could anchor in your stage presence and your confidence and, and, and your wholeness in preparation for the purpose for which you were created. It was never intended, beloved, I want you all to get this because this is for you. It was never intended, beloved, for you to pull over and park in somebody else's vision. How many of you have pulled over and parked in somebody else's vision today? Five of you. Thank you, five. And if you're not pulled over and parked in somebody else's vision, how many of you have pulled over in a vision that you had a long time ago that is no longer relevant today? But you're still holding on to it because it's what you know. It's what you're familiar with. Yes? We're all in this thing together. So the universe said, so here's what I want you to do, Esther. I want you to give notice to Rod Stewart that you're going to step out and you're going to live your vision. And I said, yeah, what? I can do that. <laughs> the universe was like, yeah, boo. The universe calls me boo. Yeah, boo. <laughs> I want you to give notice to Rod Stewart and step out. And I want you to give notice like in, in a couple of weeks. And I was like, oh, huh? <laughs> like, like, you mean like in a couple of weeks? The universe was like, I didn't stutter. Yeah, yeah, a couple of weeks. And I said, no, wait a minute, God. Rod Stewart, you know, I know what my check is going to be every week. Amen? Amen? This is my security. Amen? Amen? This is who I know myself to be. Yes? And the universe said, no. Rod Stewart is not your security. I sign your paychecks. Rod Stewart is not your identity. I have called you by name, and I know the plans I have for you. And I said, well, God, because this is how I talk to God when I get mad. I said, check this out, God. I just need a couple more years. How many of you are asking for a couple more years? I need a couple more years to put some money away and feel secure. And if you're really serious about this living my vision thing, which I don't remember asking for that, by the way, <laughs> I'll get back with you. You ever told the universe I'll get back with you? How'd that work out? And I could feel God, life, the universe, and all of my angel guides when I said that. I could feel them all say, isn't she cute? <laughs> She's going to get back with us. We just adore her. Bless her heart. And this is going to hurt us more than it hurts her. And a week later, I was fired week later. And it felt as if the rug had been pulled out from under me. 
It felt as if I had been blindsided by the universe. How many of you felt like the rug has been pulled out from under you? As if you've been blindsided by the universe. Were you really? You had been given all of these signs, all of these divine impulses, but you were too afraid to listen. And so the reason that I was given for being fired from Rod Stewart was because I had reached an age and a weight that was, you know, not appropriate to sing Hot Legs behind Rod Stewart. You do understand, darling. And I just want to ask you one thing. You can bleep this out of the video later because I don't want this to get out in public. Have you seen Rod lately? Was that, was that, was that? Only kidding. I'm only kidding. Because here's what I've discovered is that the person that seems to have hurt you the worst, this person that seems to have hurt you the most, who abandoned you, who rejected you, who betrayed you, that was the only person that was an available channel for your prayer to be downloaded. It was the only way that your own prayer, answered prayer, could get your attention. And what someone else might mean as betrayal or abandonment or whatever is the universe saying, it's only because I love you. Because you must return home. You must remember who you are, beloved. I'm going to chase you down until you get that you're worthy, until you get that you're enough, until you get that you're deserving, until you get that the kingdom of heaven is within you. And so when I finally got off the floor six months later, out of the fetal position, <laughs> raging at Rod Stewart for what he had done to me. How many of you are raging at someone for what they've done to you? And I finally got that God had done for me what I couldn't do for myself. And I looked at those invitations piled high on the desk. And I said, who am I if I'm not a background vocalist? What am I going to do? What am I going to do for money? What am I going to do? People aren't going to recognize me as Rod Stewart's background vocalist anymore. Who am I? And on the back of the invitations, lo and behold, there were a set of directions there all the time. So when the divine impulse comes through you to grow, to be more than you know yourself to be, encoded in that ivory invitation is the way and the how. But it's operating at a higher vibrational frequency than the frequency that you're operating on of resistance and fear. But it was there all the time. And the first direction on the back of the invitation, which all of these directions are outlined in my book, Soul Recovery, which is the recovery and rediscovery of your essential nature of wholeness, the first direction said, Esther, don't ever think again. <laughs> because you keep trying to figure out the solution from the place of the problem. There is no answer in fear. There is no answer in worry and doubt and trying to figure it out. And so my biggest week, when, when my po most powerful week I had one week was when my mantra was every day, I don't know crap. That wasn't the word. <laughs> I want you to say, I want you to look at an issue that you're having in your life right now. I want you to say to yourself, I don't know crap. I don't have the answer. But there's an answer within me. I'm getting out of the way. And I will be led by spirit within. And we get to do that by coming to believe that a power greater than us could restore us to sanity. And we are restored by being returned to our original nature of wholeness. And we get to do that by turning our will, our resentments, our fears, our doubts, our worries, over to the care of God, of life, as we understand God. And if the God of your understanding isn't working for you, it's time to get a new understanding or a new God. I don't know where your invitations are showing up in your life. I don't know if they're ivory, if they're pink, or if they're red. But they're all saying, back away from thinking and surrender. 
Surrender, let it go. Get dressed, get still. Meditate. Learn how to pray from God. Allow the universe to declare itself anew in, as, and through you. Forgive. Learn the process of forgiveness. Step into the healing instead of stepping into the problem. And that is getting dressed. And it is from that place, I'll continue to get dressed. And I'll meet you at the party. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Close your eyes. Take it in. I once heard a powerful story about a man who stood in his truth with such conviction. stepped out of the crowd and said, are you Martin Luther King? He said, yes I am, and the well-dressed man spit on him. King took out his handkerchief and wiped the hate from his suit. He gave it back to the man
this belongs to you. So